Welcome to Spring Creek. We are so glad you're here. And if you'd like to find out more about our church, text NEW to 96995. Check out these great events happening in March. For more information about these events and to stay up to date for everything we have at Spring Creek, visit springcreekchurch.org slash events. Thanks again for being with us today. Well, here we are in week three of our series, Rated PG, which stands for in our case, for parental guidance needed. This is all about parenting. It's about what to do with your kids, about what was done to us, it's about our role as parents. And today's message is all about helping your kids learn to deal with anger. As we get started, would you just bow your heads for just one moment and we'll pray together. Father, we are indeed thankful for what you've been teaching us over the last couple of weeks, and I know that you have something special in store for us today. I pray that, Lord, our hearts and minds will be open to the things that you mean to speak to us, and I pray, God, that you would help us as parents to first and foremost learn how to deal with our own anger so that we will better equip and train our kids how to deal with theirs. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, all kids, like all adults, get angry. Anger is the body's fight response to keep us safe when we feel threatened. It's called the fight-flight mechanism. The problem is our instincts are now perverted by sin. So our instincts cause us to want to fight against things that aren't really a danger to us, which means when something happens that upsets us, we get angry to protect ourselves, even if the threat isn't really much of a threat. That's why our three-year-old's defiance can trigger our rage. When we're hurt, when we're afraid, when we get frustrated, we get angry because the body interprets all of those things as threatening. For kids themselves, it's a little different because kids don't have a context for their upsets. A small disappointment can seem like the end of the world. Worse yet, since they don't have a fully developed frontal cortex to help them self-regulate, children are even more prone to lashing out when they're angry. So a child really doesn't fully understand what's happening to them, and they lack the internal mechanism to dial it back that comes as we get older. Most of the time, when kids get angry, they just want to attack their little brother who broke their toy, or their parent who they think is unfair, or their teacher who embarrassed them, or the kid on the playground who made fun of them. But here's the crazy part. We expect our kids to handle their anger constructively when we don't have that great of a track record when it comes to handling anger ourselves. So this message is about both. That is, how to help kids and how to help parents better deal with anger. Because when anger is handled in a healthy way, everyone wins. Learning to manage anger is one of the most important skills we teach our children. Because if it's not handled well, it can damage, even destroy them. Some of you are facing this battle right now. I mean, your kid's fuse seems to have gotten shorter and their emotional outbursts more frequent and loud. You've tried everything you know what to do, you know, but nothing seems to be helping. When a child is angry, he or she doesn't always know what's the matter. This is how you help them the most, by helping them trace it back to its source so they can deal with the actual problem and not the symptom, which is the anger. And we'll talk more about this a little later. But I believe the best place to begin is with understanding your teenager. So the first principle is teenage is a time of constant change. The fact is that children go through more physical changes during five years, the five years of adolescence than at any other time in their life. Of course, I've also heard it said that between the age of 12 and 17, a parent can age as much as 20 years. Kids really do change a lot. I mean, their brains change so that they can think abstractly. That only happens with age. Their bodies produce more oil, making their faces break out and sending them into an emotional tailspin. And of course, as if any of us could forget, they become fertile. Teenage is a time of constant change. Physically, they're growing rapidly, inside and out. Emotionally, they're often all over the map. But of all the changes, all those changes that happen in teenage, they, that leaves them with a feeling of insecurity. They're prone to misinterpret everything, the, to question whether what they're feeling or thinking is, is normal, which leads us to the unique challenges of the teen years. 
So every stage of life has certain questions, challenges, and crises which have to be mastered, that have to be overcome in order for a person to grow and move to the next stage. A lot of teenage behavior, even rebellion, is normal when you look at it in light of these challenges. So one of the first challenges they face is the challenge of independence. This is why last week's message was so important. Kids have to be taught responsibility because the younger a child learns that good choices have good consequences and bad choices have bad consequences, then the more they can be trusted with greater and greater freedom as they mature and they enter into the teenage years. This gives them a healthy sense of independence in their teen years, which they both want and need because they've proven that they're responsible. Dr. Eric Erickson, a well-known name and a well-known child development expert, found that adolescents need to develop an identity separate from their family and move toward independence. And anger often accompanies these changes. Anger occurs when a child feels powerless or unable to control their present situation. That's why your child snaps at you when you ask her to pick up her shoes or pitches a fit if you disturb their video game. It's like you're impinging on their world. When teenagers feel like they don't have control, they'll do a lot of things that demand attention. That's why they often slam doors, break things, or even hit their siblings. These are all attempts at regaining a sense of control over something. Now, while we all agree that these actions are unacceptable, it's important that you acknowledge your child's anger while still setting clear limits on that sort of behavior. A second very real challenge a teen will face is identity. The central question asked by teens during these formative years is, who am I? And usually the first way they answer that question is, I'm not you. (laughs) Teenagers like to try on different values and beliefs and clothes and hairstyles in an attempt to figure out who they are and what they like. One of the ways teenagers like to individuate, that's what we call this individuation, is by playing the game, you can't make me hold to your values. So what typically happens, you know, and this is very normal in healthy teens as a part of growing up, is they're constantly trying on new values. And this is how the game is played. Your teen comes home from school and they'll say something like, I think anybody ought to be able to have sex with anybody else and it's nobody's business, especially their parents. And then they just step back and watch you go crazy. Because you say, you know, what do you mean have sex with anybody, anytime? Are you crazy? Do you know what sort of diseases you could get? And what makes you think that while you're living under my roof, you could do anything you want? Who put such an idiotic thought in your head? And you gave them exactly what they were looking for, a reaction. As a result, you force them into the position of defending a value that they don't actually hold. But suppose you responded in a different way. Except this time you said, well, that wouldn't work for me. I'd rather not live with a venereal disease for the rest of my life, but I can sure see how a teenager would see it that way. Thanks for sharing. This way, you haven't allowed this to become adversarial. You haven't given them the reaction they were seeking, and you've stated what you believe and left the kid with something to think about rather than something to get worked up about. By the way, let me offer a little guilt relief to parents with angry teenagers. Ross Campbell, who's a noted authority on children, said this, often a child will express more anger at one parent than the other, and the mother is usually the target. I have talked with many wonderful mothers who interpret this as negative and consider themselves bad mothers. This can result in guilt and depression, and yet in most homes, the child's behavior is not only normal, but indicates that the mother is doing her job beautifully. So get this, in the majority of cases, the mother is the only person in the world with whom the child feels so loved and so secure that he or she feels safe enough to express negative feelings to her. He or she knows that no matter how they behave or what they say, mom will always love them and never reject them. Of course, that doesn't mean that mom should permit inappropriate expressions of anger and do nothing about it. But as long as a child is bringing their anger to their mother verbally, she's in a great position to help that child navigate the anger. Bottom line, a child's anger has to come out somewhere. So what's best for it to come out verbally, and it usually does so with the mom. That it happens this way doesn't mean she's doing something wrong or that the father is the better parent. It's just that the child feels safe enough with mom to do this with her. So don't feel guilty just because you're dealing with an angry teenager. Be grateful that they perceive the relationship as strong enough to handle it. 
So what I want to do is I want to spend a little time examining our own ways of dealing with anger. I call this next point essentials in helping kids deal with anger. And the first essential is simply this. Never expect a child to handle anger any better than you do. You know, there's this writer for Reader's Digest, and he was talking about how he was studying the Amish community in preparation for an article that he was going to write about them. And he noticed that in the schoolyard, the Amish children never screamed or yelled at one another. Now, this amazed him. So he spoke with the principal of the school, and he told him how remarkable it was that he never once heard an Amish child yell. Then the principal said, well, have you ever heard an Amish adult yell? You see, most times children and adults don't express anger all that differently. Yes, adults use a larger vocabulary, have a wider variety of resources to draw from, including physical strength. But if you watch an angry adult expressing their anger, it's usually not all that different from an eight-year-old kid. I mean, just watch TikTok and you'll see what I'm talking about. Here's what the Bible says. How can you teach others when you refuse to learn? So when it comes to expressions of anger, bottom line is this, you can't teach others what you yourself refuse to learn. For example, when we respond to Susie yelling at Jimmy by yelling at Susie to stop yelling at him, aren't we just reinforcing the very behavior we want to eliminate? Anybody else guilty of that besides me? Dr. Peter Stravanova, he's a neuropsychologist at Children's Medical Center right here in Dallas. He said kids learn how to deal with anger and disappointment by watching those around them. And parents are first-in-line role models, whether or not they realize their kids are paying attention to parents. In the book, Good and Angry, Exchanging Frustration for Character in your ki- You and Your Kids, the authors noted this, some parents just escalate conflict. There's a point where parents need to be able to say, this is getting a little tense and we need to take a break. We've got to help parents know not only how to start, but how to stop conversations. This will help them better deal with their anger because most teens respond to harshness with more intensity. They try to compete with a parent who's harsh or angry. It's so true. So if you tend to flare up every time your child does, you need to ask yourself, do I want my kids to focus on me and my emotion or their behavior and how they got themselves into this mess? I mean, what we want to teach is self-control. That means the ship is already sunk if you're not in control. Foster Klein and Jim Fay with uh, Parenting and Love and Logic, uh, they said the troubles arise when parents display similar fireworks to their kids. And by doing so, they're rewarding our children for, they are, or we are rewarding our children for sassing us. We are giving them emotion and they thrive on parental emotion. But, you know, this principle also works in reverse. What I'm saying is you can use this approach to keep another person from becoming angry. You can control the other person's tone of voice by your own voice. Psychology has proven that if you keep your voice soft, you won't become angry. Even the Bible said the same thing years ago. Listen to this. A soft answer turns away wrath. So when you model control, you teach your children how to control themselves, which means before we can help our kids deal with anger, we have to learn to deal with the rush of our own intensity. Here's something else essential in helping our kids deal with anger. Never tell someone to do something you can't make them do. For example, you know, I never told my kids to quit crying or stop being angry. You know why? Because one, it doesn't work. And two, you can't command a feeling. Now, you can tell a child where to go to have his fit, you know, away from you. You can say, Johnny, I really don't need this right now. You can go to your room, look in the mirror, and find an appreciative audience. That way, we're teaching our children that we don't like to be around angry, out-of-control people. But you need to understand why kids carry on like that, why they don't stop with the crying or the anger. One of the reasons young people go on and on is when they're upset is because they want to make sure that you know they're upset, that you understand. So next time, just say this, I know you're mad at me, and I appreciate you letting me know. But now that you know that I know how you feel, and I know that you know, I don't need to know anymore. So if you need to think about this some more, then go up to your room, and we can talk about this later when your voice is as calm as mine. It's also an important thing to remember the difference between an assertive expression of anger, which we should encourage, and disrespect, which we should always discourage. You say, but Pastor Keith, I I know how to make them stop. Well, of course, anyone can power up. Anyone can scream or frighten their child into compliance. 
but you're not helping a child process what they're actually feeling or become more responsible if you just fly off the handle yourself. What you're doing is using fear to stymie any emotions that make you uncomfortable. Honestly, the one thing your kid is learning is I just need more volume and more power because that's how you get your way. Another thing we need to do is always think about the message behind the message. You know, the strongest messages we pick up from other people are the implied ones, not the actual words they speak. You could call these covert messages. In other words, when we imply that our kids can handle a situation, they can. And when we imply they can't, they can't. It's like the three-year-old sitting on the floor of his bedroom. He's trying to get his shirt on over his head and over his shoulders and really struggling with it. His mom just stood there and watched. Finally, a friend looked at her and said, Ida, why don't you help that boy? And the mother said, I am helping him. Of course, the mother wanted to give her son a hand, but more than anything, she wanted him to have confidence that he could do it on his own. So there's always a message behind the message. So think about the message behind the message when we say something like this to our kids, do it or else. So here's two ways of dealing with the exact same problem. You could say, Johnny, you better get your homework done right now or else I'm gonna take away your phone. Or you could say, I'm just wondering if graduating from high school isn't all that important to you. Now, what's the difference between those two messages? Whenever we send messages like, you better do it or else, we're also sending another message, one that says, what am I going to do about your problem? But in saying it the other way, we keep the ownership of the problem in the kid's court. What are you going to do about your problem? Or how about this message or what's behind this message? Do it and I'll really get mad. Now, we talked about this last week. I mean, let's say another kid comes up to your kid and says, hey, Johnny, I got some really great stuff. Let's go out behind the school and, you know, snort it or shoot it or smoke it, whatever they say. How do you want Johnny to respond in that moment? Do you want him thinking, you know, if mom and dad find out, they're going to be really mad at me? Or do you want him thinking, you know, I don't know what that stuff is. I don't know where they got it from. I don't know what it might have in it. I don't know if this is something I might get hooked on and not be able to quit. I don't know if there's something toxic that could kill me. No, I'm not doing that because that's just stupid. Which way do you want them to think? Mom and dad will be mad if they ever find out or that this is irresponsible. I shouldn't do it. You see, one of the worst messages we can give to our kids is that they shouldn't do something because it's going to make their parents mad. First, it encourages them to make decisions based on voices outside their own head. No wonder they give into peer pressure. We've trained them to do that. And second, it can reinforce the immature rebellion in kids who will go out of their way to make their parents mad. But either way, they're not owning their own problems. So how do you de-escalate? This is all about de-escalating angry situations. First, hesitate. The Bible says it like this, a gentle answer quiets anger, but a harsh one stirs it up. Or how about this in Ecclesiastes 7, 9? Only fools get angry quickly. You know, the Bible never says that anger is forbidden. In fact, there are two scriptural guidelines for handling anger. Number one, warm up slowly. And number two, cool down quickly. You see, anger is a feeling that makes your mouth work faster than your mind. Therefore, angry words come easily. But as parents, we need to pump the brakes. We need to hesitate and not just react in the moment. And while you're hesitating, you need to remind yourself of several facts about kids. Like first, because they're kids, they're going to act like kids. So don't expect them to handle anger perfectly while they're still learning. Don't expect them to have the tools to handle it, especially if we haven't given them those tools. And second, most childish behavior is unpleasant. Ain't that the truth? I mean, my grand girls separately are a delight to be with, but sometimes when they're together, they act like the Satan sisters. I mean, they go out of their way to provoke one another. And third, if I love them only when they please me, or I only convey my love in good time, then, then, then that's conditional love. And as a result, they'll, they'll never feel genuinely loved. Instead, they will always feel insecure. And fourth, if I only show my love when they meet my requirements or expectations, they'll grow up feeling incompetent. Kids need to know that they're loved regardless. In fact, some of the best times to demonstrate your love is after they've messed up. To be able to say, I love you and nothing you ever do is going to change that. But we need to talk about this attitude or this behavior. 
You see, even in their unacceptable behaviors, including acting out in their anger, children are asking the question, do you love me? And do you love me enough to not give up on me? Because they're immature, I promise you, kids will express their anger immaturely. This means accepting their ways of expressing anger not as desirable or even acceptable, but as normal. Then we can lead them away from that toward more constructive ways of expressing their hurts, their fears, and frustrations. A second step we need is to evaluate. The Bible says the heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. You need to ask yourself three essential questions. And the first one is simply, what's really going on? You know, when a child is angry, he or she doesn't always know what's really the matter. And this is where you help them the most by helping them trace it back to its source so they deal with the actual problem. I've said this many times. Anger is a secondary emotion. I promise you, it's never the first thing you feel. The first thing you feel is hurt, fear, or frustration. Anger always comes on the heel of one of those primary emotions. So when I ask myself what's really going on, I need to be asking, is my kid hurt? Are they afraid? Are they frustrated in some way? That way, I'm dealing with the real issue and not just the symptom. The problem is most of us can make the jump over to anger so quickly that we don't even think about what is the underlying hurt, fear, or frustration because anger conceals more than it reveals. Look at this verse, which is a classic case of anger flowing out of deep hurt. The Bible says, now Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. That is, they hated Joseph. Now, all of us need affirmation, approval, affection, and acceptance. So what happens when an emotionally dependent young person doesn't get those basic needs met? Well, like in the case of Joseph's brothers, we get angry. Those feelings are terribly painful for a child to handle. It's gut-wrenching to feel like a sibling is loved or favored more highly than you are. In fact, it causes so much inner trauma that kids will bolt over to a second feeling that's less painful. A second emotion that is directed more outward than inward, a feeling that makes them feel less vulnerable and more powerful, and that emotion is anger. I'd rather feel anger than unloved. Now, some of you know those feelings well because someone who should have cared for you didn't, and it eats away inside of you. So rather than dwelling on that feeling of being unwanted, I shift over to anger instead. Because once we're angry, we can take all those hurt feelings and focus them on that rotten person who made us feel so bad. Of course, this doesn't empty us of all those uncomfortable emotions. It just allows us to redirect them outward rather than feeling them inward. So when we see that our child is angry, we have to be a detective in a sense and help them sort through what's really going on. What triggered the anger? Because there's always something there. As long as you remain focused on the anger, you'll move further and further away from a solution. So then we ask the second question, what do I really want out of this encounter? Just compliance, obedience, or responsibility for their own behavior? See, if you ask yourself, what is I really want out of this encounter? It will eliminate responses that only serve to take you further away from that desired result. The third question we ask is, what's the best way to get it? I read this great story about this elderly man who bought his retirement home in a little town far away from the hustle and noise of the big city. Well, just after he moved in, he heard this horrible racket coming from the alley behind his house. It was a group of teenagers coming home from school, banging on all the metal trash cans out in back of the houses. And it went on every day for a week. Finally, the guy had all he could stand. So he called the teenagers over and said, guys, I have a business proposition for you. I'll pay you two bucks a piece just to go down my alley, banging trash cans and making as much noise as you can. The kid said, sure, mister, no problem. Well, at the end of the second week, the guy calls him over again. He says, you know what? I don't have quite enough to keep paying you guys two bucks a piece. I can only afford a dollar a piece this week. But the teen said, no problem. We'll do it for a dollar. At the end of the third week, the guy says, all this money I've been paying you has put me in a financial pinch. I'm afraid all I can afford is a quarter a week. And the kid said, forget you. We're not going to do all that for just a quarter. So he got rid of the behavior 
without becoming a problem to him. And that leads us to this, eliminate. By eliminate anger, to eliminate anger on your part and let the consequence be the teacher. Now, I told you last week, the Bible teaches the law of sowing and reaping, which is the law of consequence. Listen to this from Galatians 6, 7. You will always reap what you sow. Now, the old way of doing things and what many of us face from our parents was anger, threats, lectures, intimidations, beatings, whippings, whatever you might call it. But like we looked at last week, the Bible recommends a gentle approach to correction. If kids are really going to learn anything, then they have to learn to live with the consequences of their own choices. Now, let me share with you another example from the folks at Love and Logic that, about allowing consequence to be the teacher. So Phil's 17-year-old daughter, Tiffany, came home with alcohol on her breath. Do you think that Phil should talk to his, his daughter immediately or in the morning? Definitely in the morning. Will anger or sadness work better? I promise you, sadness will work much better. In the morning, so dad comes in and he says to Tiffany, I felt sorry for you last night. I smelled alcohol on your breath and I started to worry about you and alcohol. What would you guess about using the family car right now? And Tiffany says, I, I guess I might not be able to use it. And dad says, good thinking. Now, did dad set a limit? Yes. Is Tiffany going to try to talk him out of it? You better believe it. Can she? No. Because no matter what Tiffany says, dad has the perfect response. Probably so. So here's how the conversation goes. Tiffany begs, but I won't do it again. And dad says, probably so. Will all the other kids get to do it? Probably so. So now Tiffany tries to draw her dad into the argument. He says, well, dad, you've got a big problem with alcohol and this is all about you. And now I can't drive. And dad says, probably so. So Tiffany asks, then how am I supposed to get to the mall or to work at the mall? Now you can see at this point, Tiffany's trying to give her problem to her dad. So dad says, I don't know. I was wondering the same thing myself. So Tiffany says, but I'll get fired. And dad says, probably so. Tiffany's dad understands that for Tiffany to learn, she has to learn from the inside out. And she's not going to do that as long as Tiffany can look at her father and blame him for her poor choices or scapegoat on his anger at her. Instead, Tiffany will learn best by dad allowing Tiffany to face the consequence of her own choice and not getting in the way of that learning. So as we wrap up today, let me remind you of God's remedy for anger. Now, remember what I've been pointing out every single week in this series. God is the archetype. The original pattern, the flawless design, the one in whose image we are made. Here's the definition of an archetype. I've shared it with you each week. An archetype is the original pattern or model of which all things of the same type are representations or representations or copies. So God teaches us by word and example how we are to parent, which means the best example of how good parents treat their kids is ultimately how God treats us. So what do we learn from God about anger? Well, God's anger is always just because it's always based on a thorough knowledge of the truth of any given situation. Now, that is so unlike us. It's extremely rare that any of us knows the whole truth about any situation. But that doesn't stop us from getting angry, does it? We assume we know that, there's all, that we know all there is to know, and what details we don't know, we can fill in with whatever best suits our theory of what actually happened. I call this the great lie that accompanies anger. It's the lie that we know the whole story. So this lie is what makes us feel justified in hanging on to anger because we tell ourselves, I know what's really going on. We think that we know the whole truth when really only God does. We can't even see how our own emotional investment might be coloring our perception. God's anger is so different from our own, and one of the biggest ways is how long it takes for him to become angry. Listen to this verse, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. This is a description repeated many times in scripture about God. He's slow to anger. You see, you can't talk about anger without talking about patience because that's what patience is. It means to be slow to get angry. The Greek word for patience is makrothumos. Macro means long or slow and thumos means heat. In other words, you're slow to heat up. You have a long fuse. You don't boil over quickly. You're patient. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but God doesn't try to be patient. He just is. He doesn't have to bite his tongue or restrain his emotions. He simply bears with his children through thick and through thin. 
Now, I'm not saying that God never gets angry because he most certainly does. But in his anger, God never misinterprets a situation. He never feels threatened. He never loses control. When God gets angry, it's based on an accurate appraisal of the situation, and he never gets angry quickly. And you can mark it down. When God is angry, he will never be negligent or unkind. He won't violate his own nature, even though he's angry. So we act out in anger, and then we stew on it, we ruminate on it, and we refuse to let it go. But God is exactly the opposite. It takes him forever to get angry, and once he does, he gets over it quickly and he moves on. It never lingers. He doesn't hold grudges. God has no long-term relationships with the things that have caused him pain. That's because anger was designed by God to have a short shelf life. The longer you hang on to it, the more it spoils, the worse it gets, the more toxic it becomes in your spirit. So why does God have this immense capacity for patience? Well, the single biggest factor in God's patience is his understanding. He knows us. He knows what we're really like. He sees us in our weakness and immaturity. So he is understanding, which means if we want to be more patient, slow to heat up, we have to better understand our children where they are developmentally, why they struggle with anger, why they can't see the big picture. It's why the Bible says this, a patient man has great understanding. The key to patience is understanding. The more you understand your kids, the more patient you're going to be with them. The more you're taking in the larger reality of what's actually going on, the more patient you are, the less inclined you are to heat up, lash out, say things before thinking. Impatience is a sign that there's more to the story than what you're seeing, that you don't know all the facts, that the first and most important thing is to be like God and slow down and learn before you react. You know, we're just a week into Lent, the 40 days of fasting leading up to Easter. I don't know if you participate in this Christian tradition or not, but I want to suggest, even if you didn't start a week ago, you could start now with us. You can join us on this journey of fasting till Easter, whether that's a meal every day or abstaining from Starbucks or Netflix or sugar or soft drinks, whatever it might be. But what many people don't realize is how fasting, how Lent helps us with our anger. Let me explain. I've told you before, in the spiritual disciplines, we participate in things like solitude, not so that we can get really good at being alone, but or, or that we participate in the spiritual discipline of stewardship so that we become good accountants. That's not the point. The spiritual disciplines are not intended to make us good at the discipline itself. The discipline has an indirect effect on our spiritual life, and that's the way fasting works. We don't do it to lose weight or to prove to ourselves that we can go without a meal or our favorite food. The reason we fast is because it reveals the things that control us. I mean, think about it. How often do we cover up what's really going on inside of us with food and other good things? But when we fast, the things we're trying to cover up, <laughs> they all come to the surface. Listen to Richard Foster. Anger, bitterness, jealousy, strife, fear, if they're within us, they will surface during fasting. You know, it's not by accident that the first thing on Foster's list is anger, because that's typically the first emotion that gets revealed when we fast. We get grumpy. We get short with people. We snap at people over small things. Now, we tell ourselves it's just because we're hungry. But could it be that we've been carrying an undercurrent of anger in our life and been covering it up with alcohol or cigarettes or ice cream or McDonald's or Starbucks or Cinnabon or Facebook or shopping or TV? Could it be that our anger is the cap that's holding back our real hurts and fears and frustrations? You see, if you fast during Lent, the spiritual purpose is that God can bring this unresolved stuff out into the open. Because when things are hidden, that's where they fester. Hidden is where they remain in control. Hidden is where it gets its power because the power of sin is in its secrecy. But in the open, we can release it and God can heal it. He can forgive it. We can be set free. So fasting has the function of freeing us from unresolved hurt, unforgiven acts, unconscious memories, hurts, fears, frustration, by bringing them out into the open where they can be dealt with. And sometimes the reason we're having so much trouble dealing with our kids' anger is because we have unresolved anger in us. We have a hurt that remains unhealed. So when our kids act up, they get a dose of our unresolved anger. They become a convenient target. They get our anger that's really totally about something else. And I know this 
because this is what I did with my wife for years. You know, this June, Brenda and I celebrate 40 years of marriage. But 30 years ago this June, we were in deep trouble in our marriage, and a lot of it had to do with my anger. The way my therapist said it was this, you got the right anger, you're just constantly choosing the wrong battlefield. You see, my anger was all about hurts and unresolved pain in my life, and until I faced that, nothing was going to change with my misdirected anger. Fasting during Lent, the reason this is such a powerful spiritual discipline is because it's like house cleaning for the soul. When you fast, you get in touch with all the things that you've been medicating or distracting yourself from. But at least now they've come to the surface. They're now out in the open where they can be faced, where they can be healed. And that's what God is trying to tell some of us right now, that your irritability, your grumpiness is not from going without your favorite things. Is that now that you're not covering it up, now that you're not distracting yourself from it, now you're not medicating with foods or alcohol, it's coming back to the surface of your life. Now that you're aware of it, your primary task today is to yield it to God, to trace it back to its source, to ask yourself what her fear or frustration is driving this anger. Get freed from that, and it'll make all the difference in the world with you and your kids. For your kids, you need the patience that comes from understanding knowing that they don't have what they need to regulate anger. Know that they will often be in touch with the anger, but not the hurt, the fear, the frustration driving it. But because you're the parent, because you work through this stuff yourself, you can help them be better equipped to deal with anger when it happens because you know what it's like to deal with it the right way. And of course, most of all, I thank God that he's patient with me. I can't even imagine what an endless source of frustration I could be to him but he doesn't see me that way, does he? You know why? Because he truly sees me. He gets me. He understands me in my weakness and immaturity, and he doesn't wait to let me know that he loves me until I get it right. He loves me in my weakness, in my failure, in my sin, and that's why I'm so confident in my standing with him. He's proven he truly loves me unconditionally. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for who you are. We are so grateful that every week as we look at what it means to be a good parent, we see you. You are the example. You're the template. You're the prototype. You're the one in whose image we're made. And like with anger, God, we need to emulate you. We need to slow our reaction time. We need to get the bigger picture. We need patience, the slowness to heat up because we understand our kids like you understand us. Lord, you're the perfect example. We're the flawed pattern. So God, we want our life to become more like you. I pray for any parent who, as we've gone through this message today, maybe they're in touch, not so much with their kids' anger, but with their own. And how often that anger gets provoked, how often they find themselves incensed over their child's behavior or what they say or back talk or whatever it might be. And many times we respond to fireworks with more fireworks. God, we want to be more like you. We want to resolve the stuff in our life that is so easily triggered that we cease to be in the role of the parent and we only mirror what we're seeing in our children. God, We want to help our kids better, but to do that, we've got to deal with anger in ourselves first. So God, help us to realize that the anger is just the symptom. We have to dig deeper. We have to ask ourselves, how am I really hurting? What is it that I'm truly afraid of? What is it that's frustrating me in this moment? Because if I get in touch with those things, I get in touch with the source. I get into what can be yielded to you and what can be healed. God, I thank you that there is a healing path for anger in our life. And God, for any parent who's just up against the challenge right now, uh, whether that is uh, a teenager who's going through this time of differentiation, who knows how to push all the buttons, who, who knows how to provoke, who actually takes a certain level of delight in seeing these reactions out of mom and dad. God, I pray that you would help these parents to be able to stay the course. To understand, God, that, that especially I, I think of the moms and, and, uh, and the thing that Ross Campbell was saying, how that so many moms are often the, the very subject of so much of the anger of kids that it comes out 
primarily directed toward mom, but it's primarily directed there because the child feels so secure with mom. God, I thank you for for great moms that are like that, moms who have stood by their kids through thick and through thin, who whose kids know that they, they can come to mom and they can say what they need to say, and mom will help them sort it out, help those parents to get rid of the guilt about that, to be able to say, God, I just want to do my best, and I want to follow you and lead in your example so that my kid can learn how to better handle this anger. I pray for every parent who who feels inadequate to this task, like like we all do, that God, we are totally dependent on for you doing in through and for us what we can't do for ourselves. That Lord, when we find ourselves up against a limit, limitation, that our, our first and primary place we seek is you, your help, your direction, your understanding, so that we really get the bigger picture and are responding to the actual need. God, we also need to remember that we have brothers and sisters in the family of God, other parents in this place that we call the church, your family, that we can lean into them for their wisdom, for their experiences, for their strength and their hope, because they can help us when we feel all alone in the parenting challenge. God, I just thank you for everything you've been teaching us, how you've been challenging us. Continue to walk with us, Lord, as we walk with you. We pray it all in your son's name. Amen. So grateful that you would choose to join us today or later in the week when you happen to join the broadcast and check out the message. Please take a few moments. uh, Let us know what's going on in your life. I mean, if, if there's a special prayer need that you would really like the church family to be praying for, the pastor to be praying for, let us know. You can private message if it's that personal, that intimate. You can put it in the comments on any of the messages, whether you've, you're, you're watching this right now on our online community or on Facebook or on YouTube. Please let us know what's going on. Let us know how we can help, how we can pray for you. And if you feel really totally um, inadequate to this challenge, let us show you some great resources that we think uh, that will help you. Um, I mean, not just community, being alongside other parents, but some great books, some great teaching, some other lessons that might really help you become a great, greater parent. So God bless you. I, I pray that today is a very blessed day and it's a very blessed week.